liberals are sure they're in the reality-based community and anybody who disagrees with them is, either has a bad brain or, or in some other way rejects empiricism and science and that they are the only ones working with the building blocks of facts and reason. And I call bullshit on that. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're sitting down with Jonah Goldberg of National Review Online and the author most recently of The Tyranny of Clichés, How Liberals Cheat in the War of Ideas. Jonah, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so let's get uh, right to it. What, uh, describe your, why did you write this book right. about the tyranny of clichés? Well, uh, you know, as I say in the very beginning, uh, you know, the best muse there is is being annoyed. You know, um, as you probably know as well, it's much easier to write something if something pisses you off, right? And uh, I go to a lot of college campuses, and I always, I learn that these kids are taught to be incredibly skeptical of ideology. If you say something conservative or libertarian, their, you know, their spider sense starts tingling. Um, but they'll often talk to you in these incredibly potted, stupid cliches. You know, they'll say things like, better ten guilty men are go free than one innocent go to jail, and then they'll sit down like they've said something interesting, right? And I mean, um, you particularly, you talk about the play on the Voltaire line about I'll, def you know, I disagree right. with what you're saying, but I'll defend, uh, I'll defend to the my death, death you're right to say. Right. Right. And, and then and they and sit down. And then they sit down. And, and these like, kids, yeah. they're obviously lying. You know, they're right. not going to take a bullet for me. And they right. say it after the speech, so who gives a rat's ass? And, right. And they're not responding to anything I said. It's a way to dodge. Okay, so there. I mean, there's you know, there's a tyranny of cliches. I mean, a cliche is a cheap way of, of not really having to think much about right. things and stuff like that. So, uh, how does how do liberals play right. into the? Okay, cliche? so as you know, because we've gone butted heads on libertarian versus conservative yeah. stuff many times. Uh, libertarians and conservatives, and in fairness, Marxists and socialists, you know admit their ideological biases. Right. They say, these are the things that are important to me. I'm a defender of ideology, um, rightly understood. I think ideology is simply your checklist of priorities that you bring to new events. You know, you say, does it expand freedom? Does it constrain right. freedom? Does it respect the dignity of an individual? And you go down a list right. of things you respect right. or don't respect, right? And we admit it, and we have arguments about it, and we can get really dorky about it. Hayek versus Burke versus right. Ayn Rand and all that kind of stuff. It's like Dungeons and Dragons dorks about uh, this stuff. Friedrich Hayek versus Salma Hayek. Exactly, yeah. right. One's easier on the eyes, one's better to read. That's right. And uh, I didn't realize that Friedrich Hayek had written anything. <laughs> um, and uh, liberals don't have that orientation. And w now define liberal, because I mean it's interesting that you talk about socialists or Marxists, because uh -huh. I tend to agree with you. They are as, as much outside of the normal political conversation. So they have, I mean they're in a minority and they're right. in a kind of marginal position. What, but a lot of conservatives, uh, certainly conservatives at National Review throw around socialists for, uh -huh. you know, uh, people at Reason probably do as well. Uh -huh. what's, what's a liberal to you? Well, I think a liberal is basically, I mean, a classical liberal is you, right, right more or less. And, and to a certain extent, me, and there are interesting debates to be had there. But um, a liberal is basically the latest label that we apply to the progressives and the progressive mm -hmm. tradition. And I trace this back to the pro progressive intellectual tradition. It comes out of pragmatism. There was this whole approach, uh, uh, William James, John Dewey, Horace Callan, where they took this approach and they said, we don't believe in ideology, we don't believe in philosophy, we're going to take the pragmatist razor, uh, we are going to go everything simply on the facts and the data and all of the rest. So I mean really you're talking about in a contemporary context, this, I mean the New Republic as a magazine sure. ex expressly came out of that, uh, that movement, that point of view, but then it's, it's kind of a main, liberal mainstream Mainstream media. liberalism, a, a lot Paul, of centrists. Paul a lot of, Krugman. Paul is, Krugman. Is a archetypal. Although Krugman to his credit will from time to time actually admit that he is a progressive. Right. He doesn't think it has any, in any way contradicts Right. simply doing the right, yeah. smart, technocratic well, thing. Well, and, and to talk about uh, kind of cliches of ideology, one of the uh, people that you talk about is Andrew Sullivan, uh -huh. who has uh, wrote a book a few years ago called The Conservatism of Doubt, or the, you know, Reclaiming the Conservative Soul. He talked about the conservatism of doubt. Right. And his cliche kind of that you take issue with, this is kind of interesting to me, he said, you know, that conservatism is actually about epistemological humility. That right. it's, you, you have to be in doubt of the ability to know things if you're a conservative. But you actually attack him as being, uh, you know, as kind of faking it. So right. talk a little bit about that and how that plays into the larger conceit of the tyranny. Sure. Of the I mean, as, as I believe I said in the book, I find the argument he makes very compelling and it really rings a bell with me. I, right. I like Oakshot, I like Burke, I like all these guys. But first of all, anybody who's actually read Sullivan, you know, he's 
often in error, but never in doubt when he writes things, right? I mean, he's a very strident, declarative, categorical writer um, who's convinced that he's right on the gynecological spelunking and Sarah Palin and all that nonsense. But he has this refrain, which you often hear is that you can't, it's, I think it's a line from Oakshot, you know, you can't, uh, you can't walk through life if you're looking down at a book. Mm -hmm. And it's this deep skepticism, and he recounts this tale that Oakshot tells. I think he mangles Oakshot on this, but he tells this tale about how uh, you, know, you can't learn what's truly important in life from books. And this is a really strange sort of approach to human wisdom, right? The idea that you cannot have, um, you cannot convey wisdom through books, right? Because all ideology really boils down to is accumulated wisdom. Right. It doesn't mean that it's always right, you have to be open to revision, but you know, Hayek thinks that there's a lot of accumulated right. wisdom, um, and that as a libertarian and as a conservative, we would both agree that, that there is an empirical historical case for, the, for human freedom and markets and all of the rest. And one of the ways we believe these things is because we've read about them in books. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that somehow you cannot outsource some of your intelligence, some of your knowledge to books, it strikes me as ludicrous. But that's sort of the upshot of the argument that he's making, is that we can't do that. Um, you know, another one of the, uh, the, the book, uh, which is, uh, you know, when I, when I first heard about it and when I first got it in the mail, I was like, okay, this is going to be a real, a, a real uh, kind of flimsy clip job. But uh -huh. in fact, like liberal fascism, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's heavily researched, uh, you know, and, and a serious attempt to grapple with stuff, which I think is really great. Um, one of is, so there's a bunch of different large areas sure. uh, you talk about cliches. One is uh, liberals constantly say conservatives are anti-science. Right. Why is that a cliche, and what what lazy thinking do you think is going through that? Um, well, first of all, they te the, the, the tendency, and they're obviously conser there are conservatives on the right. I mean, the anti-evolution crowd is I right. think is ridiculous and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, the the argument, the form of argumentation you get from the left is essentially that. Um, you're anti-science if you disagree with us about a bunch of certain public policy, you know, mm. options. Um, existence of the problem or the proposed solutions. I mean, whether you're talking about Marxists or progressives or whatever, there is this, this is written into their sort of DNA is this presumption that they're on the side of science. And sometimes they have good science on their side and sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes they actually practice what Hayek called scientism, right, which is a, mis it's a category error, right? It's misapplying the authority of science into realms where it doesn't belong. And that's a lot of what technocracy was and all of that, right? But more often than not, what they're really just simply doing is they're saying if you disagree with our preferred public policies, you're anti-science. As if, you know, uh, on like global warming, for instance, um, I'm willing to concede that there is global warming. Um, I'm willing to concede that man plays some role in it. I'm not willing to concede it's the problem that they think it is. And I'm certainly not willing to concede that therefore we must embrace this sort of neo-Malthusian wet blanket approach to the economy. Why can't we just try and fix it, right? I mean, I'd rather fix it. Um, and uh, they think that if you don't go in lockstep with them on every single one of these things, you're anti-science. But now what do you do with, uh, you know, I mean, there are high-profile conservatives who are anti-evolution, who uh -huh. challenge the idea that a Darwinian evolution happens over the long, you know, long path of history or short one, I mean, a Republican presidential nominees, and I'm not sure that any ideological or intellectual movement should be held responsible for the politicians who claim sure. its mantle. But I mean, we had Republican debates where, you know, guys were raising their hands saying, no, I don't believe in evolution. Um, is that, I mean, is that a le legitimate attack that more people who call themselves conservatives seem to be skeptical about things that seem to be settled in scientific areas? Yeah, look, I mean, is there something going on on the right that I think is sort of a double-edged sword, right? It's, on the one hand, it's, I think it's a healthy skepticism. Um, on the other hand, it's sometimes applied in areas that we, I don't think, need all that much skepticism, right? right? And so on the evolution stuff, I'm not with them on this stuff. But part of the problem is, is that there's very few public policy implications of this. This is basically asking people, are you going to deny your faith in public? Right. You know, and it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, it's a shitty catch-22 kind right. of question to hit people on. And we can, I mean, if Michelle Bachman can't change, if she can't get rid of the minimum wage, she's not going to be able to get rid of survival of the fittest. Right. 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 And, and the idea that somehow there's a huge public policy component to affirmations of evolution. Right. But why can't it be... Why can't we say someone is anti-science if they are um, anti-nuclear power or, or anti-DDT 
or anti-vaccine. Anti-vaccine. I mean, it seems to me that these are, you know, there's but, this. Uh, so let's, I, I mean, I agree. And uh -huh. I think that that's one of the powers of the book is that it forces everybody, regardless of your ideology, to kind of check your cliches. But then is this a liberal issue or is it, I mean, simply that you're bringing it to light because you're a conservative and you're looking at the way liberals critique you. Um, because there are conservatives, you know, I, I'm thinking of something which is consistent from the Bush administration to Obama, both of whom pledged to do science-based right. medical planning, something like Plan B, the after, uh, the after morning pill, right. which is not an abortion pill, it's a super duper birth control pill. They, the FDA under both of them said, hey, let's just make this over the counter. Right. Each of them have faltered on that. Is this, I mean, is cliche mongering really a bipartisan or a transpartisan issue? It is absolutely a bipartisan transport. I mean, everybody does it. Everyone has their buzz phrases. Everyone has their bumper stickers. There's bullshit flung right. from all sides. That's not my point. Yeah. My point is, is that when I have an argument with you, it's understood that you come at things from a certain perspective. You, va you value certain right. you know, priorities more than I do and vice yeah. versa. And so, but because we share enough of these priorities, we can have a really interesting argument about where to draw these lines. You know, the, one of the cliches yeah. is that conservatives and really libertarians, right? Because from the left's point of view, the right is sort of monolithic, which is annoying. But that we're dogmatic. We have this right. dog, we're market fundamentalists, we're dogmatic, yeah. we're closed minded. And first of all, calling libertarians closed minded is a really odd yeah. rhetorical thing. But um, no, it's not. <laughs> and, but uh, the reality is, is the dogma is the other way around, right? The left is dogmatic because they don't even question the role that government should do good where it can, when it can, whenever it can. And so, as I say, somewhere in there, I'm not saying that these are all the cliches in the world, I'm not saying that only liberals. My point is, is that, that liberals, because they don't, they're the ones suffering from epistemic closure. They're the ones who are sure they're in the reality-based community and anybody who disagrees with them is, either has a bad brain or is ensorcelled by ideology or is a fundamentalist or, or in some other way rejects empiricism and science and that they are the only ones working with the building box of facts and reason. And I call bullshit on that. My argument is that they, we all have ideologies and it's healthier and more honest to admit you have it and that way someone can judge where you're coming from on things. And, and certainly we're in a world now where whether you want to or not people are going to be fact checking, I mean not just fact checking you but kind of epistemologically checking you out in all right. sorts of ways. Who are on the broadly construed uh, left or liberal, left of center, who do you think is, is a serious uh, kind of intellectual that you think is, is running away from the cliches and doing the kind of work you think everyone should do? I don't know, I mean, I, I think Bob Samuelson, of, mm -hmm. uh, certainly of mainstream columnists, is a guy who really just sort of goes where the data try to takes him. And um, I think, you know, as but much he's, as- he's not really an ideologist, right? I no, mean, he's he, not. I mean, he's one of those rare guys who seems to be, right. you know, he doesn't have a fully fledged uh, membership in a tribe. As much as I beat up on Jonathan Chait in the yeah. book, um, and as, as incredibly wrong I think he is on this question yeah. of empiricism versus ideologues and all the rest, I do think that he does go where he thinks the data is taking right. him, and he is a pretty, uh, he can, you know, he can be partisan and all that kind of stuff, but I think he, he tries harder than most to play it fair and will break with his own side on certain mm -hmm. issues if need be. Um, and a Peter Beinart, who I used to debate all the time, used to be at a New Republic, he's on something of a journey. <laughs> I can't quite figure out what's going on there. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't have a very long list of these people. Who's the, who's the worst uh, malefactor on the conservative side who is, you know, just the cliche monger? Uh, um, Name names. <laughs> Conservatives supposedly like to do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, the easy targets are people like Michael Savage, you know, and that kind of thing. And but he's also not. I mean, he's not writing not at the same guy. level. Yeah, of, no, yeah I you agree. know. I mean, he's. Um, I would say, uh, what's his name? Mark Gerson mm -hmm. um, just drives me batty, and he, in part, because he buys into a lot. All Michael the, Gerson. Michael Gerson. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Conservative columnist for former the Bush, Washington Post. The, yeah. you know, uh, right. The foremost champion of compassionate conservatism, right. which is buying into this sort of liberal trope that the role, you know, that the measure of someone's soul is how much they support bloated, inefficient government programs yeah. and whatnot. I, uh, you know, by most measures, I have no soul, but especially by that when I think I'm in a deficit <laughs> situation. Well, you know, let's talk a little bit about the longer arc of your career. You were the original editor of National Review Online. You created the site in what year? 
Uh, well, I just signed up in late, I think it was late 1998, but I didn't become the first editor of something real until early 1999, I think. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's, it's odd because now the internet uh, or, you know, websites are such a part of our lives, we forget there was a time before that. But National Review, out of all of the, uh, all of the political magazines, I think, not only had the first fully fledged website, but also the best. Uh, talk a bit, a bit about, you know, where did that come from? What were you trying to do and yeah. do you think it's worked well? Well, I mean, on the editorial side, you know, one of the things I was trying to do was send a little bit of a signal that this is not your father's National Review anymore. I mean, not on the important big issues, and I'm a big fan of William F. Buckley and all the rest, but tonally, culturally, as you know, you know, National Review used to be, you know, Latin puns and Chesterton quotes and that kind of thing. And the people who are reading online tended to skew coastal and young rather than the people who are subscribing the print tended to be skew Midwestern and old, which I think is what, when I first started, that's sort of what Reason's readership was too back then. And, um, uh, and so I you know, wanted to be more conversational, more water cooler and all that kind of thing. And on the technological side, we had something, some real advantages. One, because the magazine came, was bi-weekly, um, or semi-monthly, I can never keep those things right. straight. Um, fortnightly. Fortnightly. Yeah. Uh, um, we kind of had the staff of a full-blown weekly magazine, but with enough downtime that we could actually allocate some resources. It was a much harder transition at first for weekly magazines to go to the web, simply because they had so many deadlines just getting out a real magazine, and the monthlies tended to have really small staffs. Um, and so we sort of were in this sort of little sweet spot that way. And, um, but we also had this great advantage, you know, uh, brand names really helped in the early days of the web, you know. And there was all of these awful websites out there that you didn't know whether you could trust them, you didn't know if it was real news, they were, you know, they were getting into the media food chain and then blowing up in people's faces, people relied on it. And National Review had that sort of conservative good housekeeping seal of approval and it helped us enormously and um, so originally it was seen basically as a marketing tool more than anything else it drove subscriptions um, for the magazine and was successful in those terms more than any other in my now opinion. you know it's interesting we were recently at a uh, lecture by Leon Cass uh, you know an old uh, an old beyond his years critic even though he is you know a thousand years old now uh, and he was kind of complaining about things like the internet, that yeah. these break down, they subvert traditional hierarchies and conservative patterns of learning. But, you know, National Review, arguably more than any intellectual magazine, any thought journal, has, uh, you know, has kind of flourished online yeah. to a point where I know a lot of people who, you don't even read the print edition anymore. Right. Is there an irony there uh, that, you know, a conservative magazine really was first out of the box with a, a fully realized website? And what does that say about you know, is conservatism a pose? Is it really standing athwart history yelling stop? Or is it standing athwart, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of porn ads saying, let's go, let, <laughs> let's go, go, go? Um, it's, uh, look, it, it, it's, it's a complicated scenario, right? I mean, first of all, the right has always been, right, right, broadly understood, has always been better at new media technologies than the left because the left owned the mainstream technologies. Right. So right? this so is stuff like direct mail, direct politics, mail, uh, radio, 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 talk radio and, radio and all the rest. So they were always pioneers, um, uh, you know, uh, VHS movie, you know, documentaries, you know, were, were very big on the right for a while. Um, and I think this was sort of part, I mean, the two groups that always exploited new media the best were porno pornographers right. and conservative, you know, outfits. And, um, and National Review, I have to say to their credit, from the beginning, my first meetings with the suits there, they said, look, the mission of the magazine is the mission. And if the magazine can't do the mission anymore, maybe it'll just be a website or maybe it'll be, we'll go monthly. I mean, they were never said, National Review doesn't exist if we lose this paper thing, even in the early days. Um, but look, it is absolutely true that technology, one of the few pieces I've written for Reason Magazine was sort of on this point. Technology is vastly more disruptive than ideas most of the time, you know. Um, you know, the car did more to unsettle established relationships and communities in the United States than Nietzsche has ever done. <laughs> but you can argue with Nietzsche, you can't argue with a Buick, right? And um, Well, you can, but you won't win. Right, yeah. and the Buick doesn't care. Um, and so I, I think that one of the things that's often left out in this, and I think that Leon Cass, who I have a lot of respect for, but I disagree with him on a lot of things, is a spokesman for a different kind of conservatism. You know, the, the fundamental 
argument that I make about conservatism is that, you know, as Hayek says, in the United States you, is the one country in the world that you can call yourself a conservative and still be a defender of liberty. Because conservatives are defending a liberal institution, the Bill of Rights, the founding of the country, and all of the rest. And, um, and one of those things, and this is why one of the cliches that get in there, you know, we're supposed to be hidebound and dogmatic and resist change, but we're the ones who are defending the free market as much as anybody. And the free market is the greatest engine of turmoil and change that there is. What, the way the left defines change, or progress, is expansion of the state. That's what William F. Buckley's talking about when he's saying stand athwart history yelling stop, is the sort of Hegelian notion of the state as the engine of history. Um, well, let's, uh, let's talk about, I don't know if they're engines of change or uh, you know, they're kind of like those cheap uh, solar f things that you, uh, you, know, you can turn a light bulb on or power a calculator with a solar cell. Uh -huh. The presidential election, here we're, you know, we're stuck with Obama on the one side and Mitt Romney on the other. Whom among us can contain their enthusiasm? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what's, what is a conservative, what's a National Review conservative to think? Because Mitt Romney cannot be anybody's idea of a good candidate for the Republican Party, but you guys are going to vote for him. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll, so without apology, I'll vote for him. Yeah, and yeah. and like what 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 keeps you in that tribe? Or I guess another way of saying this: What do I need to do to put you <laughs> in a third party ticket uh, today? Uh, it would have to be a really compelling candidate who has a shot at winning, and uh, and a really really good. Shot. So you're saying you wouldn't have voted for Barry Goldwater? in 1964. What, who, what other choice was there? I, don't, I, mean, I mean, but he had no choice. Yeah, but he was the, but he was the only alternative, yeah. right? You know, I mean, that's my point. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you know, the Buckley rule of the most conservative candidate electable mm -hmm. still applies. And um, what is wrong with Mitt Romney then in terms from a, from a conservative perspective, recognizing that, I mean, I, I, know, what, I know what I think is sure. wrong with him, but, uh, and is there any hope for this guy? Well, look, I mean, uh, the, and I admit this is trying to make the best of the situation kind of explanation, but I kind of look forward to the days where there's more of a transactional relationship between the conservative movement and the Republican Party, or the president at least, right? Um, one of the things, which I know you won't disagree with me on, that got a lot of conservatives in trouble during the Bush years was this embrace of Bush as sort of an identity politics avatar of our, you know, right. our spirit, right? He's, he's one of us, so we have to defend him. And a general, fairly repugnant blurring of the distinction that if it's good for Bush, it's good for conservatives. If it's good for conservatives, it's good for Bush. As if conservative and Republican have no distinction, they're not synonymous terms. I would like to move away from that. I would much rather have a relationship with the presidency where we say, here are our five things, and we can have a debate about what those five things are, and then everything else is a negotiation. And um, I'm not saying we have to go all the way to Nixon, you know, where Nixon actually thought that the Buckleyites were more dangerous than the Burgesses. But and in 1960, National Review pointedly did not endorse him. Did not endorse uh, uh, Nixon yeah. in the 60 election. Will, will National Review eventually endorse Mitt Romney as the, uh, the candidate for president? I think it, I don't know, yeah. you know, it's not my decision to make, right. but um, and I'm, I, I, I'm in, the, in on the conversations, but right. I, we haven't had that conversation yet. Um, I would guess that we would. I mean, yeah. the, one of the things, just to keep in mind, is that the enthusiasm on the right to vote out Obama mm -hmm. is so much greater than the lack of enthusiasm for Romney. And um, there is a strong argument to be made that, I, that a lot of people make that Romney, because he is this Bain guy, I mean, you had that Bain yeah. consulting issue, you know, where he's just, he does, he, he, he's mission focused, right. right? If he gets in there and Paul Ryan is basically running Congress, um, there is, it's conceivable that whether he believes in it or not, I mean, let's forget that, and to some extent, who cares? We care more about what he does. He could be the mission guy who does the sort of Bain Capital version of implementing the Ryan Yeah, then the agenda. question is why would anyone, particularly a conservative, want to implement the Ryan plan that increases federal spending by a trillion dollars a year. Well, there's but, that debate. Yes. Uh, let me ask, in, t in terms of the, uh, you know, politics and whatnot, John Derbyshire, a longtime writer for National Review uh, and, and online, uh, was recently fired for uh -huh. a racist column that he wrote. What was wrong with what he did? It wasn't for, it, it was not at National Review, it was at Talkie Mag, and he talked about how 
you know, come on, let's face it, uh, you know, blacks really are more prone to crime. Uh, you know, they act in certain ways. He, it was in the form of a letter to his children where he was counseling them, look, if you're in a place where a lot of black people show up, especially if they're wearing, you know, hoodies and stuff, right. get the hell out of there. Um, what was wrong with that? that he should have been fired from his association with National Review? Well, I mean, there, there are two ways to respond to this. One is, um, you know, what was wrong with what he wrote, regardless of whether it justified firing him, right? I mean, I, was, I think it was the first one out of the block saying I found it indefensible. And I do find it indefensible. It doesn't mean everything in it is... And you're not pulling the undergraduate Voltaire thing. Right? No. <laughs> no. Not every, I mean, yeah. It doesn't mean every single point in there was right. wrong. In fact, right. mu much of his data was right. And... Um, but the conclusions he draws from the data are, not, are, are far more controversial and doing it in the context of the advice he gives to his children, that you basically, here you go, you sum up these people by the color of their skin, I, found, I just find repugnant right. and, um, and basically indefensible. Um, uh, it's one thing to say that this is sort of my rule of thumb. It's another thing yeah. that this is how I'm going to inform the consciences of my children. Right. That's, that's what really right. bothered me about it. Um, now, the second question is, what was so bad about it that he, that, that he had to be fired by natural review? Again, I didn't fire him. Right. And for years I defended Derb, um, who's written incendiary things before, although I'm not sure any of were as bad as this, on the grounds that, you know, my vision for The Corner, which I also created, this group blog right. in National Review, was always that um, we wanted to show that as long as you were right of center, that there was this vast amount right. of diversity, disagreement, we actually hammer these things out, we have these arguments, intra-family, not just libertarian conservative, but different flavors of conservative, right? right? And, and in full view. And in full view, right? And you know, it's not what, a, what the editorial meetings are actually like, mm -hmm. but it's, the, yeah. it's a sort of simulacrum of it. And my argument about Derb is we need someone who is sort of paleo, you know, Anglo or Anglophytic, um, traditionalist, literary, um, and if we got rid of Derb, we would have to hire somebody far less talented <laughs> you know, to fill that spot. But at the end of the day, um, the controversial stuff that he was writing was sort of mounting up, and um, you know, there's a reason why we do have the expression, or the cliche if you like, the straw that breaks the camel's right. back. You know, um, straws don't normally break camel's right. back. The reason they break camel's back is they're the last thing, and right. now we've gone too far. And I think that the thinking among Rich and Jack and, and the other people who made this decision in National Review was that Derb was getting a lot of attention for his writings, for publishing things in other places that we would never print ourselves at National Review. And I think that this was, there was a long time in coming and I wish it, you know, honestly, I wish it hadn't happened. I wish he hadn't written it. I wish, you know, all sorts of things, but wishes don't win the day. But I think it was the right decision. What are the, you know, what's an issue where libertarians and conservatives really have been pulling apart, at least since the end of the Cold War? I mean, it's always been a, a you know, a fractious uh, coalition at best. What is the issue between now and, you know, say the election in November where there, there is, you know, 90 percent or more overlap? Uh, you know, the, where yeah. we're, we're pulling in the same direction. I don't know. I mean, you have a good, as good a sense of this as I do, but I, I would say certainly Obamacare, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, I think that, you know, the Mark Stein argument, which is also my argument, but he sort of articulated it first and better, is once you go down this road to Obamacare, you're fundamentally changing the relationship between, man, you know, citizen and the state. You know, you really are achieving FDR's dream of turning citizens into clients of the state. And that should stew the bowels of libertarians, yeah. if not more than conservatives, then at least as much, you know. And, uh, uh, and so it seems to me that if the election becomes a referendum on Obamacare, that's a good way to keep that coalition together. And what do you think is the biggest point of kind of separation? I think it's got to be some version of either national security or the drug war, right? Um, uh, certainly culturally, the libertarian movement uh, you know, I always say you judge movements by what they prioritize, right? And so while I know libertarians have a million positions on a million different things, the stuff that puts asses in the seats and gets people to show up at rallies and gets people mad is really national security and the drug war stuff. And, um, and what is it with conservative uh, groups then? I mean, is it, is it actually that, gay marriage of Mexicans or is it... These days, uh, I mean, yeah. these days, truly, it's an Obamacare thing. I mean, yeah. one of the, this is one of the reasons why I think the Tea Party thing was so unbelievably healthy, right? Uh, 
two generations, three generations of liberal social sciences that whenever the economy goes tits up, the, everyone rallies around the state and demands more from the state. And they were all expecting Occupy Wall Street to show up. And it didn't. And instead, you get this mass populist movement that cares about federalism and the Constitution and all of the rest. And federalism is the real key, right? I mean, that is the way to really keep the coalition together. Is you, push this stuff to the lowest level possible. If they want to legalize this in this state and ban it in that state, let them do it that way. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, I don't know if Romney really believes any of the Tenth Amendment stuff, but maybe he does. Okay. Well, Jenna Goldberg, author most recently of The Tyranny of Cliché, How Liberals Cheat in the War of Ideas. Thanks for talking for Reason T uh, with Reason TV today. <laughs> I'm Nick Gillespie. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks.